Simon, uh, next, Simon Warsop is Life Analytics Director um, and a partner at Aviva Quantum. Um, the fact that he's Life Analytics Director doesn't mean you can ring him up and ask him when you're going to pop your socks. It's a bit more complicated than that. Um, but of course, the serious story is how do we use modern data science or how does the industry use modern data science uh, to inform their business? Simon, we're delighted to have you. Please talk to us. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you everybody for um, having me here today. Um, so, as Mike has said, I am a Life Analytics Director at Aviva. Um, I've been doing that role for the last two or so years um, to bring data science into life insurance. Um, in the past, life um, data science has been way more uh, dominant in general insurance, so car insurance and, and home insurance. And so as I talk about the application of data science um, at Aviva, I will tend to uh, focus on um, general insurance examples such as um, car insurance and home insurance. Um, so I'll just get my slides to move. So um, as I talk through this evening, um, my agenda looks something like this. So I'm gonna spend um, probably about uh, 15 minutes or so in introducing insurance and data science to the audience um, and actually take an opportunity to um, turn some of the audience into data scientists if you're not already data scientists. I'm going to talk about why data science is booming um, at the moment, and it certainly is. I'm going to talk about the, um, the way that data science has revolutionized uh, insurance, albeit it's done it in a very quiet way from the customer's point of view. But I'm also going to talk about why um, data science and the application of research can actually be a double-edged sword with winners and losers. And, and in spite of that, the future is bright. So I will cover that in my final uh, topic. So introducing insurance. Um, and, and it's a pretty simple concept that most of us um, do take part in. Uh, but, but the basic prin principle is that the premiums of the many pay for the claims of the few. So for example, in home insurance, we might pay a few hundred pounds um, insuring against a potential loss of, say, £500,000. Uh, but because we're all sharing our premium and the likelihood of the £500,000 claim is pretty unlikely, then we can all part with a small, um, a small premium uh, and get the, uh, the safety of the, uh, the potential claim payout should we have a claim. Um, so this is the pooling of risk idea. And, and some people get confused with the pooling of risk idea that, that the pooling of risk suggests that we should all pay an even premium. But, but of course, insurance has been built on the principle that the premium paid should reflect the risk that you bring to the pool. Um, and the example, so I work, uh, I, I, I live in Norwich. I originally joined uh, Norwich Union back in 1990. Um, and Norwich Union's origins go back to, um, uh, go back to 1780. In 1780, Thomas Bignold um, moved from Kent to, um, to Norwich, and in doing so, wanted to ensure the um, goods that he was bringing with him from Kent to Norwich, and found that he couldn't get insurance. So when he arrived in Norwich, he went to the local coffee shop, sat down, spoke to local business people, and said, wouldn't it be great if we could insure our stages that are going up and down from Norwich to London? Um, and, and presumably in that conversation, it went something like, well, if we all put you know, five pounds um, into the pot, if somebody loses a stagecoach, then they can take 20 pounds out, perhaps. Um, but of course, what would then happen is people would say, well, well hang on, I'm only running one stage a week and you're running 15 stages a week down to, to London. So why don't we why should we pay the same? So from that idea comes the premium pay reflects um, the risk that you bring to the pool. However, um, by doing so, you can make um, insurance unaffordable for some people. And then we get to the tricky problem of fairness. Um, and, and in this um, case, fairness can be to the group, i.e. we all pay a um, premium that's, that's um, proportionate to the risk we bring to the pool. But you might then get an issue of fairness to the individual. Is it okay that we have then charged a premium that makes insurance unaffordable for, for example, young drivers or for um, homeowners who live in a, a, a floodplain. And we'll hear more about that um, as I continue. So that's the introduction of insurance, uh, a concept maybe many of you will be very familiar with. Um, but I'm also going to introduce data science. Uh, 
So um, my favorite definition of data science is it's the best rebranding of statistics that statisticians could have hoped for. Um, interestingly, data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century. This is true. In fact, just a few days ago, I keyed into Google, sexiest job of the 21st century, and there is the response, data scientist. That's a, a, a genuine Google search. It might say more about who are um, programming the algorithms at Google than it says about data science being a sexy job, but there you go. Um, so data science is the sexy job of the 21st century. That's great to know. It doesn't really help us understand quite what data science is. So um, IBM have had a go. Data science combines the scientific method, math and statistics, specialized programming, advanced analytics, AI, and even storytelling to uncover and explain the business insights buried in data. And do excuse the Americans there from the quote, they're not mine. Um, so trying to bring that alive, an image I'd like to use is there are um, three disciplines of computer science, mathematics and statistics, and domain expertise. And by domain expertise, I mean, um, for example, in insurance, it'd be knowledge of how insurance works and, and what the risks are and, uh, and what the benefits are. Um, so as those three disciplines overlap, that's the sweet spot for where data science is. And again, that doesn't really help us perfectly understand what I mean by data science. So I'm going to have another go, if you'll um, permit me. So um, data science is the application of algorithms, um, be they simple statistical models, supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, um, or others to predict or explain something using data. Um, I won't explain the difference between supervised and unsupervised machine learning at this point, um, but we can come on to that um, in questions should anybody want to um, explore that. So we're using algorithms to predict something or to explain something using data. And, and a number of those algorithms, those favorite algorithms that data scientists might use um, if you're talking to them uh, are now appearing on the screen. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, a, a bingo or a buzzword to, um, to, to, to make the scientists, data scientists sound clever. Um, and some of the um, algorithms here are not actually that new. So for example, neural networks, which many people may have heard of, were first proposed uh, by Frank Rosenblatt um, using his perceptron neural network back in 1958. But um, so hopefully that explains a little bit about what data science is. But I did say that I'll try and make um, the people on the call today data scientists. So I'm going to uh, go a little bit deeper um, into decision trees and gradient boosting machines. And I think I've um, chosen these two because one, um, decision trees are a building block for gradient boosting machines, but also because to me, gradient boosting machine sounds very, very interesting. I assure you it's nothing like as interesting as it sounds, but please bear with me and I will turn you all into data scientists. So decision tree. Um, so we have a data set that from which we would like to produce um, predictions. So here is a data set I've collected. It's based on the weather um, during 10 days um, and whether we chose to play or not to play badminton outdoors on those days. So that's my data set. Um, so in data science, when we're doing a prediction, we are trying to predict the target. So here, the target is labeled Y, and that is whether we decided to play or not. That's the thing we're trying to predict. And then um, the, the, the rest of the data set is, are, are the features, um, again, as we call them in data science, labeled X here. So these are whether it was sunny, cloudy, or rainy, whether the temperature was hot, mild, or cool, um, what, what the humidity was, and, and how the wind was. So that they're the, the features, as we call them. And then our data set has I rows of data. And in this particular example, we've got 10 rows of data. So what we're trying to do is use the features to predict whether we will play or not. And actually, this particular example is set up so there are really only um, um, a, a finite number of paths to get to the uh, whether we play or not. And by I, any of us could build a nice decision tree that would tell us whether we were going to play or not play uh, badminton based on the weather, humidity, uh, and, and wind conditions. So there's a nice simple uh, decision tree that we could do by eye. We'll now try and apply that uh, in, in my field of car insurance. 
Um, and what I've done here is I've collected um, data together uh, for you for this example. Um, it's a very, very simplified version of our premium calculation model. So I'm just collecting whether you're a young driver, yes or no, whether you drive a powerful car, yes or no, whether you've had any claims prior to this period of insurance in the last three years, um, and whether you're um, doing a high mileage or low mileage. And for the purpose of this, high mileage might be more than 7,000 miles a year, and low mileage or not doing high mileage might be less than 7,000. And then for each of these policies, I've recorded whether they did have a claim or they didn't have a claim. And unfortunately, we don't get a perfect answer here. So we don't always get, if you're a young driver um, in a powerful car um, with um, a claim in the last three years and high mileage, that's not guaranteed you'll get a claim. So you'll see here, policy seven had those conditions, but didn't have a claim. Um, so again, we've, we've got our features and our um, target um, labeled here. Um, I've only showed the first um, nine rows of, of policy data, but actually for, typically for this problem, in general insurance, we would use at least 200,000 rows of data. So we've got all those rows of data going on beyond. How do we turn that into a decision tree? So um, in general, for a data set, um, X, Y, for R, I equals one to N, we can see which um, feature first best predicts the first layer of the decision tree using an algorithm. Um, and again, this algorithm was published by Jay Quinlan uh, back in 1986. There have been um, improved algorithms since then, but this algorithm worked pretty good and it will get you down the first layer of the decision tree. We can then run the algorithm again to see the next layer of the decision tree and again and again and again until we have got um, a decision tree built that is okay at predicting our target. Um, it will be better at predicting the target the more um, the outcome, the target is directly related to the features um, such as our uh, weather, it will be less good if the target has also got a random element to it, such as do you crash your car or not in a particular policy year. But that's how we build a decision tree. So you guys are now pretty good um, data scientists. Just go and grab ID3, run it against your data set, know what your target is, make sure you've got your features labeled. Bingo, we have a decision tree. Decision trees are pretty good, but we can make them even better by building a gradient boosting machine. So um, gradient bo boosting machines, if we take a, a data set XY for I equals one to N, we can fit a decision tree and we can call the predictions um, H1. Um, so here we have our decision tree built from um, the data set XY, the predictions are H1. Now what we can do is build the next decision tree by taking a new data set which has features x still but the target is now y minus h1 so that's a new data set and we can build a new decision tree to um, try and predict the outcomes here and we can call those outcomes h2 or those predictions h2 we can then take um, h2 and use it to build a new data set um, again the same features x but the um, target is now Y minus H1 minus H2. And we can then fit a new set of predictions, H3. And we can carry on doing this and doing this and doing this. And now we've built a gradient boosting machine. Um, so here, here we have a gradient boosting machine. And for data set XY, the final prediction is H1 plus H2 plus H3. And as many iterations of your um, decision trees as you did. So you guys are now the second best uh, data scientist in the country. And uh, there are jobs for you um, at Aviva, should you wish to come and join us. So that's great news. Um, we, we've now got a little bit introduction into data science. But data science is going boom, uh, really is taking off rapidly um, at the moment. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with uh, generalized linear models, these are not a bad way of producing predictions from uh, relatively large data sets and have been used industrially for decades. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is they don't take too much computing power. And that might be a little bit of a clue as to why um, data science is starting to take off. Um, so the sudden boom in machine learning has been driven by um, open source code. So um, in um, the favorite languages of the data scientists, things like R and Python, if you built a code or an algorithm 
you will then put that up into the cloud and anybody can go and draw on it. So there are lots of different versions of ID3, for example, that have been built by uh, data, science, data scientists, put up onto the web. You can go and borrow that code to build your decision tree in the language that, that you prefer to build it in. Um, there's an abundance of data. Um, so one of my favorite quotes from 2013 is that 90% of data ever created was created in the previous two years. That was a 2013 quote. That quote appears to be doing something very similar to Moore's law and have continued um, to, to be applied in the last um, seven or eight years since 2013. So 90% of the data ever created was created in the last two years. So we're getting much more data coming on stream and that is fuel to the machine learning um, engine. And then um, Theo's done a beautiful introduction to compute power. Um, so Moore's law, which was proposed by Moore back in um, 1965, where he proposed that the number of transistors we could get into a chip would effectively double each um, 18 months to 24 months, has proven to be pretty much true right the way through from 1965 to now. And with people like Theo's help, would even go um, beyond um, the 2035 um, theoretical physical limits of current um, technology. So with uh, Moore's law saying we're getting better at computing and then cloud computing, which means that you can access, for example, um, Amazon's um, um, CPUs, their, their computers, without even having to have a computer under your desk. That means that the compute power available to data scientists has just been um, growing and growing and growing. Um, so th this is part of the reason why data science is going boom. But also, um, there are communities growing online. Um, and again, if anybody's um, interested in learning even more about data science, uh, I would go to Kaggle. So Kaggle um, is the biggest online community of data scientists. The, the, the site is full of tutorials and full of data sets that you can test your data science skills on. Um, they run competitions with real prizes. The great news for you guys, the second best data scientists in the country, is that Kaggle competitions tend to be won by solutions using XGBoost. XGBoost is just a gradient boosting machine, which you guys all know how to program now. Um, and, and if I look at the current um, competitions that are running, there is a $50,000 prize to the winner of the competition to best produce machine learning that spots an, um, abnormalities in chest x-rays, for example. That's just one of many competitions with real cash prizes that are running today, right now. Um, and actually, if um, you find that um, spotting abnormalities in chest x-rays aren't your thing, there are lots of other data sets on Kaggle. Um, and, and here's my favorite uh, machine learning test. Can machine learning spot the difference between a blueberry muffin and a chihuahua? And again, this is a real um, test that people have built because as you can see, this is quite complex for the human eye uh, and brain to resolve. So if you can get a um, computer machine learning code to spot the difference between a blueberry muffin and a chihuahua, actually, you know you're pretty good at um, image processing. Um, so another reason why uh, data science is going boom right now is because businesses are investing heavily in data science. And uh, I'm going to pick a, um, a, an industry completely at random. How about insurance? and have a look at um, why data science is, um, is being invested in by insurance. So I'm going to talk about in insurance, um, the quiet revolution, by immediately quoting um, a gentleman called Paul Meal, who back in 1954 um, wrote a paper called Clinical Versus Statistical Prediction. So a theoretical analysis and review of the evidence of were clinicians or algorithms better at predicting um, or, or diagnosing, sorry, cancer in patients. Okay, so not really a, an insurance um, example, but please do bear with me because this is the, the first paper I found that's got um, the comparison between uh, the experts, the clinicians and the algorithm. And, and what Paul Meal found back in 1954 was that the algorithm beat the clinicians. So in, in every trial and test they, they, uh, they ran, the algorithms overall always beat the clinicians. And that was because the algorithm was consistent and it was unbiased. 
Um, and we'll talk about um, bias uh, later. Um, if we don't get a chance, uh, again, if people are interested, please ask questions about uh, biases in, in algorithms because we certainly have some issues there. But compared to the clinicians in Paul Meal's trial, the algorithm um, was much more consistent than clinicians and it was unbiased. Uh, and one of the interesting things about that consistency is if your algorithm isn't quite working, you can tweak it and make it consistent in, in a new and, and better way to help you predict your um, outcomes. Okay. Paul Meal even then did an experiment where he um, let the clinicians come to their decision, then he showed them the algorithm output and asked them if they wanted to change their mind. And even when they could see the algorithm output, they were still less accurate than the algorithm alone. And again, that's their bias overwhelming their belief in the algorithm. So what this has proven to us is that um, expert judgment can be replaced by algorithms and indeed expert judgment is being replaced by algorithms and i think um, in terms of the wide scale sort of um, application of this that you might have come across uh, in your time um, back in the day when i was a very young man um, if you wanted to get a uh, for example a mortgage on your home you would go and sit in front of the bank manager have an interview with the bank manager and the bank manager uh, typically he uh, would decide whether you were suitable um, for the loan or not based on some very interesting things, such, for example, as whether you were wearing a nice suit or uh, whatever it might be. Um, so definitely some um, bias coming in there and probably some inconsistencies. The, uh, the banking industry replaced um, that sort of underwriting with credit scoring algorithms, which many people have heard of um, you know, back in the 80s. So the algorithms replacing expert judgment have been around for a while. Um, for general insurance, so car insurance and home insurance, uh, the algorithms replaced the um, expert personalized und underwriters uh, back in the 90s, albeit for very complex and unusual cases, you might still get a, a, a human involved. But expert judgment is being replaced by algorithms. Okay, so whereabouts in um, insurance have I seen um, data science really adding lots of uh, power to the decision making? So pricing. So deciding what price to charge a customer, um, claims, deciding whether a claim is a valid claim, uh, fraud, spotting fraudsters, um, and then customer behavior and, uh, and sentiment. So for example, um, you, know, we, we, you saw um, in our um, decision tree example earlier that how likely is a car accident for this particular customer is a very straightforward problem for a uh, machine learning algorithm to tackle, providing you have lots and lots of data with lots of different rating factors. And then once you've worked out whether that customer might have a claim or not, the next target variable you'll be looking at is the cost of a claim given there has been a claim. So how much, much might it cost given there has been a claim? But both these problems are very uh, tractable problems for machine learning. Um, in the claim space, the idea of checking if this is a valid claim is a really interesting one, relatively new because um, what, what we're doing there is quite a, a number of relatively novel um, approaches in the, um, in the machine learning space. So when you phone to, to make a claim, uh, and this might be a health insurance example, for example, where you're phoning to say, um, you know, for example, that I have, um, I, I've got some cataracts and I need to have a um, cataract replacement. Is this a valid claim? So what the claims handler has to do um, at that point is understand the policy conditions of your policy. So does it pay or does it not pay out for cataract replacement surgery? Understand the underwriting questions that you filled out when you were um, applying for that insurance. So has this customer um, declared that cataracts have been an issue for them or not? And is that therefore uh, covered by the policy? Um, and is the hospital where the customer wants to get their um, cataracts repaired, is that covered by our, um, by our relationships with the hospitals or not? And there's a whole load of different things that the claims handler has to understand before they can say a simple yes or no to me, can I have my cataracts uh, replaced on this policy? So um, typically in Aviva, you'd be clicking through lots of different screens, going back to lots of history, and as a claims handler, you still might miss a valid piece of information. So we've um, built a claims uh, model that can do all of that, reading through policy wording, looking at what a customer declared and give, give a much more accurate answer um, to that customer or through that claims handler within 
just a few seconds now. So that's been a, a, a massive improvement, both in terms of, from a business point of view, not paying claims that aren't valid, and from a customer point of view, much more quickly getting to a decision um, about that claim and more fairly making sure that um, decision has taken into account all the information that should have been taken into account and having taken it into account accurately. Similarly, in fraud, um, a couple of different types of fraud we come across in uh, insurance regularly. One is organized fraud. So this might be a, a, a crime gang deliberately taking out policies to then, um, on, on car insurance, to then have a fake crash, to then claim for whiplash claims, et cetera, organized um, fraud. Um, and then opportunistic fraud. So opportunistic fraud might be um, you've got a, a theft event happening in your house and the um, thieves have stolen your iPad. Um, if you then add on um, an iPhone and a ring and a watch that you didn't really have, we'd see that as being opportunistic fraud. So the way you would tackle that from a machine learning point of view, um, quite different approaches. In the organized fraud space, what we're looking for typically is something which links uh, more than one policy together. So it could be the email address used to buy the policy, it could be the um, IP address of the web, um, of the computer that accessed the web and taking out the policy, it could be the telephone number used. It could be um, that they're using the same uh, medical advisor, uh, lots of different things you might be looking for. Again, very, very good problem for machine learning to, to tackle. In opportunistic fraud, um, you're, you're more there looking for unusual and outliers about that particular uh, claim. Again, very easy for machine learning to, to look at that sort of uh, problem. And, and again, from the context of is this good or bad for customers? Well, it's, it's good for customers in two directions. One, it means we have to invest, uh, investigate far fewer claims because we're much more able to focus down on the claims that really are risky, um, which means we can get to decisions much more quickly for those customers who are um, honest. Uh, and also it's reduced our fraud bill um, significantly as well, which means the premiums of everybody can come down. Um, and then customer um, behavior and customer sentiment. So how might a customer react to a particular proposition? Um, so what you can do there is offer up two propositions alongside each other and look how customers um, interact with that proposition and decide which one um, is the one that customers are um, enjoying the most um, or buying into the most. Oh, uh, and that was the uh, yeah, that was the example I had for behavior and sentiment. Okay, so that brings us on to when we as the analysts are building the model, what are the requirements that we have um, of the model? Um, so the first and foremost thing we'd be looking at is how predictive is this model of the thing we're trying to uh, trying to predict? And, and something like uh, predicting, organized fraud would have been very, very difficult um, a few years ago. We wouldn't have enough um, data, but these days we've got enough data and the compute power to do the, um, to do the model. So now models are starting to become uh, very popular in, in fraud prediction. So predictive power, key and, and obviously important, but there are a, a number of other requirements of a model that we have. So the analytical time and effort, how much um, time has it taken for the analyst to process the um, to, to get from the raw data to a usable model um, how much time and effort has that taken um, has a problem now disappeared because the data has moved on the types of fraud have changed for example um, etc so analytical time and effort is, is of interest to us as is stability so the stability of a model is how much the model uh, changes when you add a little bit of new data um, into the model so in the pricing example uh, that's very important for, say, car insurance pricing. Um, you don't want, say, an unstable model where when you've updated the model, suddenly everybody's renewal price is changed by a lot because customers really don't like that. So the stability of the outcome of the model is important. Uh, the execution speed. So in the live environment, when you've keyed in all your details into the price comparison website and press go, how long does it take Aviva to return a price um, to that price comparison site? Because if we're taking 20 seconds and... All the other companies are taking one second. You'll have picked your price, chosen, and, and gone off with that particular company and, and missed the Viva out. Um, interpretation. So this is um, how easy or difficult is it for um, the modelers to explain the, to the pricing people um, how their model um, has worked and what's changed about it. I'll, I'll come on to the next stage of that problem uh, in a second. 
And finally, implementation. Can we get this into our, our live environment? So, so this is what the, um, the, the analytical, analytical guys are talking to the business about. But then the business has got requirements of the change. So novel approaches are absolutely worth chasing in lots of different ways, um, you know, for example, in claims and, and customer uh, propositions, because they help us in a competitive market. They lead us to new insights and they help us with either speed of getting to a decision or the accuracy of a, of a decision. But these changes have to help customers ultimately. They need to meet regulation. And they have to have strong benefit cases. So the cost of making the change throw off good benefits to the organization, be those financial benefits or customer outcome uh, benefits. And they may uh, be trickier to interpret. So I talked about um, in the concepts of building the model for the pricing team, you want to be able to uh, explain to the pricing team why things have changed. But ultimately, that's because the pricing team might have to explain to the customer uh, why their price has changed. And some of the um, techniques in machine learning can be quite difficult to interpret. Um, the change we make could lead to new problems. Um, I talked about stability of the model. One of the reasons why stability of a model might be um, uh, a problem is you might be overfitting. And by overfitting, I mean buying too much into the individual quirks of the last year's data and not realizing there's, you've missed the uh, underlying trends. Um, the change you're doing might need uh, a big change to administration systems, that will mean that um, it's harder to, to um, it's harder to um, put in place. It might take longer to um, understand whether you've got the benefits you're expecting um, or not. Um, it's more risky, and it might ca cause price dislocation, um, as I said, for customers with your prices. So, so you're looking at the at the change to make sure that it meets a, a number of requirements. And, and as I said, all this stuff is a, a double-edged sword. There are winners and there are losers. And uh, I'll just pull out again a couple of examples here. So better understanding uh, means customers with a lower risk would attract a lower price um, in a um, pricing example. So customers with a lower risk will attract a lower price because you can spot those customers um, in, in the whole population. But customers with a higher pr uh, risk who are less well off may not be able to af um, afford insurance. And when I, when I was working in general insurance and I was looking after uh, motor pricing, uh, this petition uh, was, was raised. Um, so the, the petition called for the insurance industry to put a maximum premium of £1,200 on car insurance for 18 to 25-year-olds. And I've got a lot of sympathy with the, with the idea. And in fact, 185,000 people um, signed up to the petition, which meant uh, it did go to uh, Parliament. And in fact, there was a joint petitions committee and transport select committee that um, experts were from the industry were, were uh, put into. And I was one of those uh, experts. And whilst I have a lot of sympathy with, um, with the approach, because um, if, you, if you are living, for example, in a rural area, and the only way you can get to college or to work is to own a car, and you can't afford car insurance, that would exclude you from, um, fr from education or from the workplace. I've got a lot of sympathy for this, um, this concern. But at the same time, uh, the idea that if you were already at the maximum premium and you had a claim and that wasn't going to change your, um, your premium would not be a discouragement or it, it might encourage risk-taking behaviour because you knew that you weren't, get, weren't going to be penalised financially for having risky behaviours. So that was our biggest concern about this approach. Um, and I'll come on to um, a way in which that has been um, somewhat addressed. So another um, recent innovation is the no need to ask, uh, answer questions. So you'll see that uh, in some scenarios, like Aviva's direct proposition, we ask far fewer questions now than a price comparison website would do uh, because we can find lots of data about you um, with your permission in public databases. So for example, if you tell us your car registration number, we can tell you lots of details about your car. We can pull that information through. Is it manual or automatic? how powerful is the engine, how many seats are in the car, and lots of other very useful information. So we can pull that information through, but that might be a problem for you if you are not on the public data sets. Or if the public data sets um, include things that you didn't know. Uh, and here's another example from um, the home insurance world. So this is a flood map of York. 
So the dark blue areas are, are, are very risky and the light blue areas are pretty risky when it comes to flood. Um, and unfortunately, there are lots of people who live in the areas covered by those um, uh, dark blue and light blue um, zones that don't realize they are at um, relatively high risk of flood. When you buy a house, one of the things that gets advertised is not the, the, the risk of flood. And, and indeed, customers' understanding of flood risk is um, a little bit uh, distorted. And again, we'll come on to that uh, in a second. But the, cl the clever stuff we're doing here can be a double-edged sword. It does create winners, but it also uh, creates losers. Nevertheless, the future is bright. Um, we um, are seeing lots of new problems come on, on online that we are able to tackle. And we are seeing lots of new propositions come along that are able to tackle those um, to tackle those problems. So um, if we touch on the flood insurance we talked about earlier. Um, so it, what, what has happened um, back in uh, 2002, uh, Aviva did a, um, a piece of work with the Environment Agency where we flew a plane over the whole of the UK and took accurate radar imagery of the terrain to build an accurate terrain model so that we could then um, get the hydrologist to pour water over it so we could get a real understanding of where it was likely to flood and where it wasn't likely to flood. And, and that terrain model was down to an accuracy of around about um, 50 or so um, centimetres. And it, re it replaced, in terms of flood modelling, the old Ordnance Survey maps, which had um, 10 metre contour lines on them. And of course, you can imagine that um, whether you've understood how the water is flowing through a particular valley um, to plus or minus 10 metres, can be the difference between a house being wiped out or uh, remaining, whereas understanding it down to 50 centimetres helps you understand whether the uh, flood water lapped the threshold of the house or stayed below the threshold of the house. Um, but in doing so, we got much better at being able to understand the flood risk of properties, and we started to reflect that flood risk in the premium we were charging. Um, and what it meant, um, so, so people living in um, very you know, big houses there was not a lot of sympathy for the fact their premium was going up, but a lot of social housing was also uh, built on floodplains. Um, and there were people living in there, uh, in those houses that could no longer afford insurance. Um, and and th those customers had, you know, basically an option of trying to afford the insurance or opting out of home insurance altogether. Most policies back then were built in a way where flood insurance and everything else like theft insurance and subsidence and um, fire insurance were all wrapped into a single policy. So if you couldn't afford it because of the flood element, you took yourself out of the home insurance market altogether. Um, and as that problem became apparent to the industry, we petitioned government to help us with a, a pool, um, if you'll excuse the phrase, a, a pool to protect these customers by everybody sharing a small premium into the pool and then customers who had a flood risk could pay a much more um, modest premium to become um, covered by that pool. So flood Re was launched um, a few years ago um, and, and has actually been a very, very successful way of um, reducing flood premiums for all the customers who are at significant risk of flood. Um, unfortunately, uh, one or two of the customers who left the, flood, uh, the, the insurance pool were still trying to find them and get, bring them back in now, they, now that we can tell them that their home insurance is, uh, is affordable, but, but that now has got a solution in place. Um, and then I talked earlier about um, the risk, I'm sorry, this one's a little bit small, um, but I, I talked earlier about the risk of trying to charge young customers appropriate premiums. Um, my, my daughter is uh, 18 um, and I keyed in um, a version of her details into the general, uh, the general accident um, proposition for car insurance and got a price back of £125 per month. Now, that's a little bit higher than, um, than the £1,200 that the petition was calling for, but the petition was a few years ago, so allowing for inflation, I, I think that telematics has somewhat solved that problem. So, so what is telematics? So telematics is the idea that once you buy car insurance, you put a box into your car that tracks how you drive and that helps you reduce your premium. Okay, but the real question, of course, is how does it help you reduce your premium? Um, and and you know, when, when we first launched telematics or black box propositions, the, um, the thing we were looking for was self-selection. So there, 
customers who knew that they would try and um, drive carefully were going to select the, prop the, the proposition, select to have the box in their car, monitoring their driving. So we knew that those first people coming into the market would, um, you know, would be the less risky people and therefore would deserve the lower premium. But the huge benefit that black boxes have had for, um, for, for society is that we can now help young drivers much more quickly recognize whether they are good drivers or not, and we can coach them to be better drivers. And that is happening with these black boxes. So um, you're getting a score uh, perhaps at the end of each month. You will also get um, alerts if you've driven badly. And those alerts are typically sent to the driver and to a parent. And from that, you then have a conversation with your child or, or the child sees that result and wants to change their driving behavior because they know they're going to get penalized in next month's premium. So this is gen genuinely dry, driven, excuse me, better driving behaviors in younger drivers, the people who are the most dangerous drivers on the road. So that's been a brilliant result. It's given young drivers the lower premiums that they wanted, and it's also fundamentally made the roads safer. So when I titled this, um, uh, this, this uh, talk, Driving Insurance Innovation, I was uh, originally thinking of it as being driving the innovation in insurance, but of course, there's also um, the driving insurance that is having innovations as well. So the future is very bright. We're going to get more compute power coming online. We're getting more specialist communities helping us understand um, um, how we can use uh, machine learning. We're getting more open source code put onto the web that we can go and borrow to use clever um, algorithms. We're seeing new applications for our machine learning. We're seeing new data um, coming online, and we're seeing new research that's helping us drive this, this innovation. And in particular, at the moment, Aviva is sponsoring two um, PhDs um, that I will uh, note. Uh, we're sponsoring more than just the two, but the two I'll note. One is on cognitive reserve. So this is the observation that the, um, the brain structures that show dementia can be present in people but they're not having symptoms of dementia. Um, and the concept here is that the people who are able to stave off the symptoms of dementia, in spite of the fact they've got the physical condition um, that would cause dementia, have got this cognitive reserve that they can draw on. Um, and, and you might have heard about the idea of taking up the piano or learning new languages. These are things that would build your cognitive reserve. So what we're doing with, with Cambridge University and, uh, and um, our student there is we are looking to design tests to spot cognitive reserve so we can then um, see if it is predictive of the onset of dementia, uh, which would be great in itself. But then can we, having measured the cognitive reserve, can we also measure which activities would improve that cognitive reserve as well? So again, lots of benefits there to society um, as we're doing that. And then algorithmic fairness. So I, I mentioned bias um, and, and the fact that Paul Meal had suggested that the reason algorithms were better than um, clinicians was because they were unbiased. Actually, my um, real observation is their biases are different and their biases are more consistent. But algorithmic fairness is looking to what biases do you build into your algorithms and what can you put in place to A, uh, monitor those, um, those biases and what can you do to then um, offset them? So, so the biases might be about things like um, in fraud, um, scorecards or fraud algorithms, you can only um, spot the type of fraud that is in your target. You can only spot the type of fraud using the algorithm that you've been spotting and putting into your data. So there might be other types of fraud that you're missing. So that would be a, a bias of the um, of the algorithm. So we're investing in those um, in, in those PhDs um, and, and find that incredibly useful for the work uh, that we do. So in conclusion, um, advancing data science have led to Real world competitive advantage for the insurers who've invested, for example, has created new winners and losers in traditional propositions, but it's also led to uh, new propositions. And I'll pause there and see if we've got any questions. Thank you. Well, Simon, that was uh, absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Uh, and um, what a surprising and inspiring story it's not just about insurance is it but the work you're doing leads to all sorts of other spin-off benefits for people and communities 
um, which is not what we imagined at all. So absolutely fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's go for some questions. And may I remind people that the way to get your questions answered is either um, to type it in on the Q&A, not on the chat function, please. Uh, and I will try and read them out more or less verbatim. Um, the other way is to uh, put your hand up. And uh, if you do that, we'll keep an eye for hands and uh, Valerie will endeavor to bring people in and we'll interleave those, um, those people who wish to, we, wish to be on the telly um, with the people whose, um, whose questions I read out. So um, let me start with a couple of written questions uh, from Joss Shales. Um, how large is the data science team at Aviva and have they seen this team grow a lot in the last few years? That's a brilliant question. We, we currently recognize around about 800 um, data scientists across the whole of Aviva. Now, um, that, that has grown very rapidly in uh, recent years, but partly because some of the traditional um, statisticians have voted themselves into the data science practice, um, such as the actuaries, um, and, and partly because we have been investing in uh, data science. But the so um, in the traditional areas where we have been doing data science, such as um, pricing, uh, and underwriting, uh, we've seen growth there because you're in a, a war of um, attrition with your um, com competing insurance companies, so you have to continue to invest to stay ahead. But then we see new areas come online, so the data science team that's spotting fraud uh, has, has come online uh, relatively recently. And then we're now investing in, in new areas, so we're now building a data science function within our, um, within our human resources area there's helping spotting where, for example, there might be a leader who is, um, uh, you know, not, um, oh, sorry, is creating a stressful work environment that might be causing absence. So there's lots and lots of different ways in which data science can help us spot underlying um, trends, you know, both within our business but also in our outside, um, in our outside market. So growing, growing rapidly. Great, thank you. Uh, and I see John Scott would like to ask a question. John, if you'd like to uh, come in. Uh, and can you unmute yourself, please, John? I'm afraid we can't hear you yet. Hello. Yeah, that should be it. Got it. Um, yeah, we had um, uh, a lecture some time ago, actually, by Hannah Fry talking about al algorithms and she raised two interesting points actually one was that algorithms are sadly lacking in independent quality control so you have never quite know what's in them and the other thing she raised was that a lot of the people who write algorithms are relatively young people who don't have wide experience of life in general which is a I just wonder what your thoughts were on those two points. Well, I, th I think they're uh, you know, beautiful observations, which is what you'd expect from Hannah, of course. She's um, <laughs> you know, ve very um, astute in, in this area. So, um, so I'm not that young, as you can probably <laughs> see. Um, and look, in terms of data science, um, the, the extent of me being a data scientist is probably well covered by the slides that I um, showed today. So I understand how to build a decision tree and a graded boosting machine in the um, you know, at the level I described. I couldn't write the code myself. But what I can do um, with years of experience is spot a model when it's going wrong and, and spot when things are not as you expect would expect and spot the conditions in which overfitting might um, occur. So I think that's where the, um, she makes a brilliant point about the, the algorithms being built by the, by the younger folks, but typically you're gonna have somebody who's a bit grayer and a, a bit more um, experienced looking over their shoulder and just spotting the little um, you know, issues that might be there. So that's where experience is actually, or expert judgment is playing a part um, in the machine learning world. Um, and of course, what happens is as they get more experience, these youngsters become, um, experienced uh, data scientists, and you can leave them a bit more alone and they don't make quite so many mistakes. But the reason we're investing in PhDs like the algorithmic fairness uh, PhD though is because uh, Michelle Lee, who's um, the PhD student there, is helping us build the monitoring tools that you can put in place to provide a level of scrutiny over what the algorithm is doing, exactly addressing the, uh, the issue that Hannah uh, pointed out. 
So yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. I have a question now from Luke He. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, what type of computers do you use in insurance to run your algorithms, data science tools, and do you require advanced or cutting edge computing power? Yeah, uh, another beautiful question. So um, for, for some of the things that we set up a while ago, there are great big um, PCs sitting under people's desks um, in the office. Um, there are, um, we, we have physical database centers um, where we've got big servers where we're running computers. But actually these days, you know, the, the real cutting edge stuff, we are using either um, Amazon Cloud, um, Oracle Cloud or IBM's um, um, Azure, I think it's called, sorry, name escapes me, um, to, to get the, to just buy the computing power that we need when we need it. Um, so it's, you know, pr pretty traditional um, uh, methods at the moment, but but using, you know, quite a lot of computing power for the high energy sort of um, algorithms that we're running. Great. Um... I'll take one more written question and then I'll come to a tele question. Margaret Costry, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, Margaret. How will the dementia research be applied to insurance? Yeah, that, another beautiful question. So um, in, in insurance, when we are taking on customers for, uh, for example, income protection, so providing um, you know, an income if you become ill when you're of working age, um, spotting things like dementia emerging there um, can be a, a, you know, a great benefit to us as, as an underwriter. Um, but the, the, the real thought here is you'll get the, the small um, benefit in the insurance underwriting process, but a much bigger benefit, we hope, in, um, in helping people manage their um, dementia into later life. So if we can genuinely find that... Um, so the hypothesis is that it's not learning the piano per se, or learning a language that will help build your cognitive reserve. It's having novel experiences. So if you already play the piano, learn a different instrument or go and learn to sail or go and learn a language. If you already speak three languages, then go and learn the piano. Um, and trying to find out which of those um, um, novel um, things are the most appropriate for any particular person. So that's where we, we're gonna get, we, you know, we hope a social benefit. But of course, we've got customers on the books who are getting older, if we can then help them understand how to you know, improve their quality of life um, and, and their length of life, that helps us very much in the life insurance and the income protection space. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, John Cook, you've got a picture question, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for a great talk, Simon. That was very interesting. Um, the, uh, uh, what you mentioned about um, Medical diagnosis reminds me that we had uh, another talk on uh, about a, a year or a year and a half ago on the use of um, AI in uh, ophthal ophthalmology with Moorfields Eye Hospital collaborating yeah. with uh, Google, which um, showed me, convinced me how powerful it can be. Um, but my question, I used to work in the oil industry and there we, we used more and more machine learning and AI techniques. We tended, the, the work that you showed on decision trees and inverting data to build a decision tree, um, not something we use so much. We tended to go the other way and, and build a Bayesian belief networks from, from physics, like saying gravity acts downwards, therefore is it likely that something's going to fall downwards? Do you, uh, and I imagine you could use the same in insurance saying if your driver is young, and male, he is more likely to prang his Jaguar into a tree. Do you use the forward modeling or the vital causality modeling um, as well as the inversion? It, it's, it's very embryonic, that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful question. It's, it's very embryonic for us because at the moment we're getting um, much more, um, oh, sorry, sufficient power from looking at the expansionary variables and then see if the expansionary variables can be used as predictive variables. But, but you're absolutely right. that The place where we're now heading to is understanding the dynamics of a claim. 
So was it a rear end shunt or um, was it you know, leaving the road at high speed or on a corner, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. to, to try and understand what the process was that got us there and can we predict the process that gets us there? So um, it, it's an area we're starting to invest in, but ha hasn't really taken off, at, at least not to my knowledge, not within Aviva. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Stephen Byard asked a question I suspect we'd all like to know the answer to. Uh, how, how are driving behaviours collected and correlated with risk? Yeah, so um, in the box, um, in the vehicle, um, there is an accelerometer and there is a GPS machine. Um, and, and so that, that data is collected and then returned to the insurance company. Um, and, and then you can do a number of things with that. So um, basically the ABC is the, the, the key thing we're looking for. So the acceleration, the braking and the cornering. Um, and effectively, acceleration, braking and cornering are all maneuvers. And when we do a maneuver, we are making a decision. And when we are making a decision, there's a possibility of that decision going wrong. So the, the people who are making the most aggressive maneuvers are giving themselves the biggest risk of a decision going wrong. So you can look at those maneuvers to see um, you know, wh whether they're um, lots of high risk maneuvers or whether there's not lots of high risk maneuvers. So it's actually um, relatively easy to model. The problem we have is the absolute masses of data we um, collect. So ha having spotted acceleration, braking and cornering and, and recognizing that's pretty, pretty well known. What you then might want to do is con contextualize it. So use a GPS to put it onto a map to understand where that acceleration, braking and um, cornering has taken place. Um, and, and see if people are you know, thrashing their car up to the roundabout and then slamming on the brakes. Um, and that's why they had a sharp braking uh, maneuver or did a deer jump out in front of them and they slammed on the brakes in the middle of a uh, open road. So these are all um, interesting clues as to whether that customer is risky or not. But, but the, the quality of the data and the, the ability to spot the good drivers from the bad drivers is very, very powerful. Um, and, as, and as you can see, relatively straightforward. Excellent, thank you. Um, George Perendia asks, uh, if your estimated insurance premium comes in unusually high or is refused, can you find the actual reason for it by tracking back through your own tree? Um, yes and no. So um, when, when you've got something very powerful in there, like um, a, a number of claims in the past um, three years, for example, then, then it comes out very, very easily. Uh, it's a very, very tractable problem to understand and interpret the model. But sometimes we see people have a, a change in premium because a number of very small factors have just nudged all in the wrong direction all at the same time. Um, perhaps there might be some correlation in there. So um, you might live in a postcode that's become a bit more dangerous because people are driving there more, um, more frustratedly, which leads to these bad decisions. Uh, and that might be you know, driving your premium alongside the fact that your make a model of car uh, might have become the target for the, the guys who you, you might have come across. Um, that There are people now who are stealing catalytic, catalytic exhaust systems because of the rare metals that are in there. And if your car suddenly just become one of the, the cars that they've started to target, and you've got that alongside people driving a bit uh, worse in your area, then you'll have lots of things nudging your premium up and you might get a big surprise in your premium. That's very difficult for us to unpick back to why that's happened. So if you've had a conversation with your insurance company, they haven't given you a satisfactory answer on why your premiums changed, that might well have been the driver. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, Andy Bush asks, how do you build experience into a black box algorithm? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question and, and, and not one that we um, actually tend to do. So what, the, the way we build the price from um, a customer um, taking out um, a black box policy is we will use their normal um, non-black box rating factors. So their age, their um, the, the, the size and um, make and model of their vehicle, uh, where they live, how many miles they declare their plan to drive. And that will drive an initial premium. Well, then, as I said, take off something for the fact they've chosen black box that in, in, in itself is self-selective. And that will give us our, our, our base premium, which we're expecting to charge them. And then having observed them for one month, we will then compare their data on acceleration, braking and cornering to other people like them and use that to adjust their premium and have a, a, a rolling change in their premium. Um, or um, depending on the proposition, it might um, 
lead to a number of red flags and ultimately when you've got too many red flags then you know the insurance company might reserve the right to take the uh, the insurance away so that that's the way it would it, it would work great thank you um howard catman asks for flood re can the government change the subsidy guarantee yes uh, it, it, what, what's very interesting is when the insurance industry approached government our um, our idea our hope was that government would happily stand as the insurer of the last resort but that's not what happened what what's happened instead is um what, what government have done is is said that flood will be funded by uh, it's about a 10 pound charge um, on every policy whether they are, are you know wet or dry whether at high risk of flood or not and, and every year about about 10 pounds from your policy will go into flood re and that's capitalized that's created the, the pool of money that's there to draw down on if there's a claim and then if you've got a property that is at risk of flood then the premium you're charged is simply linked to your council tax band so it's a reasonable um you know proxy for um, how much you might be able to afford and that premium also goes into uh, flood re and then for the first couple of years of flood re we were all worried there might be a um a claim event because if there was a big claim event if it exhausted what was in there um flood re it has has the, the has reserved the right to do a second levy against all the insurance companies to cover any losses fortunately we had three or four years of uh, very very little um, flooding and flood re is now incredibly well capitalized and it looks like that in its next 20 years of operation, which is how much longer it's supposed to be um, in place for, it won't actually exhaust its capital, touch wood. So, um, so we're hoping that we won't ever uh, get the levy two call, um, as, as it's named, but, um, but, but there's still a possibility. Great, thank you. And I have a question from Fergal uh, Murphy. Again, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, how do algorithms used for training machine learning models vary by application, e.g. for home flood insurance uh, with the spatial probability risk map versus motor insurance yeah i i, I um so i did say i'd, I'd mention um, supervised versus unsupervised learning and this isn't quite the right question to um, to shoehorn that into but i i, I will try so um there, there are lots of different um things we are trying to predict so we might be trying to um predict an outcome or we might be trying to do a classification where we're trying to separate um the groups um and but what you would do is typically apply a number of different algorithms to your data set and see which one explains the data set um, in the best way. But if you think so, for example, um, when, when we're looking at your postcode, that really is a classification problem. We're trying to say um, so each one postcode has about 28 properties in uh, properties in it. It's highly unlikely that any one insurer would have enough data in one postcode to be able to set a reasonable um, home insurance premium based on the postcode. But what we can do is a classification problem um, using just machine learning and decision tree type approach is separate postcodes into similar types of postcode. So it might be around um, rural versus um, uh, urban. It might be around population density. It might be around um, some of the other characteristics of that, of, of that postcode, the types of property, et cetera. We'll use that to classify um, all the uh, 1,800 postcodes in the UK into one of, say, 50 classifications. And then we're trying to associate, um, or sorry, find the right premium for that particular, or, or relative relativity in the premium for each particular classification for, for postcode set one through to postcode set 50. So you're intermingling the algorithms uh, types to get the outcome that you're trying to get to. But I did say I'd mention um, supervised and unsupervised machine learning. I'll just very, very quickly do that. So in supervised machine learning, what you're saying to the, um, to the algorithm is, here is my data set, here are my features, and I've labeled them, and here is my target. Can you go and please find the best way to explain uh, my target? In unsupervised machine learning, you just say to the, the algorithm, here is a bunch of data. What do you make of it? And then, so for example, in the trowers versus blueberry muffins, you might um, have lots and lots and lots of pictures of trowers and lots and lots of pictures of machine learning, uh, machine learning of um, blueberry muffins, and throw the algorithm, throw the unsupervised machine learning at it, and say, what do you find? And it might find that you know one of these um, pictures has fur and the other one has crumbs, and it might split the data set into trowers and blueberry muffins, and you go, hey, that's brilliant. 
or it might choose to uh, pick on something completely different, like which way do the eyes appear to be facing? And it might stick blueberry muffins and chihuahuas into they look like they're looking to the left, and blueberry muffins and chihuahuas into they look like they're, they're looking to the right. So that's how unsupervised machine learning works. So there you go. Two questions for the price of one. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Bill Wicksteed asks, uh, do you have any thoughts about using in-car black box coaching for elderly drivers? I'm not sure if he yeah. is one. Uh, well, perhaps I do know, actually. But anyway, um, yes, what do you reckon? I, I think that's um, a, a really good idea. And, and one of the big problems we have with um, older drivers, directly linked to the cognitive uh, reserve point, is um, it's very, very difficult to understand when your own um, ability to drive is deteriorating, let, let alone for us as an insurer who only sees your information once a year um, to, to spot whether you're um, you know, having a decline in terms of your ability to drive. But what we do know is that if we did fit a black box into a vehicle, we would spot um, the things that are indicative of, um, you know, that your attention, for example, is starting to drift, which would be things like sudden manoeuvres, because you suddenly become aware of something, a, a hazard that you hadn't spotted, and suddenly slam on the brakes. So we're, we're absolutely convinced that black boxes in um, older drivers' vehicles would be, again, a, a significant social benefit, because it would help, you know, society spot drivers um, deteriorating uh, before the accident happens. Um, and, and it would also help with insurance premiums, because we could distinguish the good drivers from the drivers who are you know, starting to get to the point where they need to be um, supported. Now, what, what is interesting to me, though, is whether that proposition will actually take off before um, autonomous vehicles start to take over and help you correct those mistakes before they became, become a problem for you. So I, I, I'm 52 years old. I'm certainly hoping that I will be able to get into a car and either you know, drive it or tell it at least where to go until the day I die. Um, whereas you know, my father's generation were, were, were at risk. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether that proposition does take off before the automated vehicle, um, uh, vehicle driving technology takes off. We shall see. Uh, well, that's very prescient of you, uh, Simon, because the next question on the list is from Michael Bright, uh, who asks, are you looking for the implications of autonomous cars with respect to insurance? Yeah, uh, yes, ab absolutely. So we think there'll be a huge benefit to um, people like elderly drivers or people who don't ever want to, to learn to drive. But, but the fundamental insurance problem is moving. So when we insure um, a vehicle now, what we're really insuring is the driver or the drivers um, of, of that vehicle. And, and some drivers are risky and some drivers are not risky. Um, and, and deciding about that is important. And the liability when an accident occurs is on the person who was behind the, the wheel at the time. We're now in this very weird interim period where cars like Teslas and um, I've got a Toyota RAV4 um, which have got lots of elements they can do themselves, like lane holding and um, um, radar adaptive cruise control, so they, they don't get too close. When those things go wrong, at the moment, I, you know, we have to have drivers behind the wheel. You have to have your hands on the wheel. You are culpable if something goes wrong. But it won't be very long before that um, culpability will move to the manufacturer. And then the nature of um, car insurance will, will, will change significantly because um, there'll be, you know, the, the car insurance policy for the individual will be relatively um, uninteresting. And the policy for the manufacturer and for their software will be very interesting indeed. Um, and, you know, and, and you can, of course, imagine these doomsday scenarios where all the software for the whole of a particular manufacturer goes wrong on the same day and you have crashes all over the world, you know, and that'll be a very, very expensive insurance event. Um, you know, I, God forbid that will happen. Uh, and, you know, hopefully there'll be lots and lots of controls being built into the autonomous vehicles to avoid it happening. But um, yes, the, the nature of insurance fundamentally changes as we move to autonomous vehicles. Great. Um, well, I have an eye on the clock and we must let you escape, Simon, but perhaps one question uh, to end with. Uh, it's another one from Luke He who says, what are the trends in data analytics in the insurance industry in the next five years? Is there anything you can see that will transformationally change the way you currently model insurance risks? Yeah, so, um, so not, not uh, no, yes. So <laughs> more, more, lots more of the same. So lots more of bringing new data online, which turned out to be predictive 
Um, I think John's idea um, earlier about some of the, the forward thinking, um, the forward predicting stuff is, is really interesting. Um, so new data uh, and, and new modeling techniques. But I think the real challenge um, is, can we build the algorithms to spot when a particular population is their insurance is going to become unaf unaffordable, predict that before it happens and put in the proposition to help them in place before we get the petition to go to parliament because you know, insurance is unaffordable for young people or unaffordable for people who live in uh, floodplains. So I see those problems coming up again and again and again, spotting those problems before they happen, putting a new proposition in place to help people manage their risk, benefiting society and the insurance company. That's how um, data science will evolve. And that's where it'll get really interesting and very exciting for a good, a good few years to come. Well, Simon, thank you. What a, a wonderful note to end on. I think it's this, your presentation was a model of clarity uh, and a wonderful example of how really very deep science can be applied to such an everyday thing. Well, I say everyday, that's not so simple, of course, but we all have to get insured. Uh, and the delight, I think, for many of us will be to see how the work you're doing is obviously important commercially, but also has enormous social benefit. Um, so an absolute joy. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thanks to uh, our members for some jolly good questions. Um, I wish you all good night and look forward to seeing you again soon. And thanks also to Theo. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.